Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We have another packed video today with a bunch of SpaceX Starship developments to talk about, Artemis development updates, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launches, successful missions from India and China, what's going on aboard the International Space Station, and so much more. Let's kick things off with Starship. In last Monday's episode of Space This Week, I covered the first testing of the water deluge system at the launch pad. Impressive as this was, it wasn't firing at full pressure during this test. Last week though, we were able to see what this beast looks like firing at full pressure, or in other words, how it will look during an actual launch. Really great footage there from Starship Gazer. SpaceX also treated us to some drone shots of the test as well. Check this out. In this shot, you can also see the legs of the orbital launch mount visible. Since this was recorded, it looks like they've now received a fresh coat of paint. I'm looking forward to seeing this get blasted off again when the next static fire happens. <laughs> Let's all have a moment to remember SN15. The flight of this vehicle was a resounding success, with the prototype demonstrating a flawless high altitude flight test, ticking all of the boxes from takeoff to touchdown, the very first Starship to do so. After conducting its six minute historic mission, Elon mentioned that there was a good possibility that the vehicle could be flown again, so we've been very excited about- oh never mind, they've scrapped it. Yep, sad news last week, we had to say goodbye to this legendary vehicle after SpaceX hooked it up to a crane and began disassembly. Here's what's left of its nose cone. Rest in pieces, friend. <laughs> One wonders what will happen to Ship 20 and Booster 4, which comprised the first full stack of Starship but are arguably less historic than SN15. What do you think? Will Rocket 420 survive the chopping block or are these two vehicles next in line for destruction? Let me know in the comments down below and of course, while you're down there, don't forget to drop a like on the video. It always helps me out in these tricky times we find ourselves in. <laughs> One of the more interesting aspects of the next orbital flight is the fact that Starship 25 will hot stage, igniting its engines while still attached to Booster 9. To facilitate this, SpaceX will need to add some sort of venting ring at the top of Booster 9 so that the rocket exhaust has somewhere to go. And it looks like that this could be it. Starship Gazer captured this photo of a new hot staging test tank, sporting a label that reads hot stage load head, which I think is pretty solid evidence that this is what it will look like. NASA Space Flight's Jack Bayer caught this footage of it arriving at the Macy's test site. Hopefully Ship 25 doesn't blast this design apart on ignition. Speaking of Ship 25, it looks like it's time that the launch site is coming to a close, for now at least. It's completed its static fire campaign and we've now seen it hooked up to a crane and a self-propelled modular transport system with counterweights and ship transportation couplers has been relocated located to the launch site. Because the hot staging ring will increase the height of the booster, Ship 25 will sit higher up than Ship 24 and Ship 20 did. To facilitate this, the Starship quick disconnect arm has been elevated, and last Monday we saw the first testing of this, extending for the first time since its reinstallation. Mega Bay 2 also continues to rise, with more parts arriving at the build site and then subsequently being installed. SpaceX were busy as ever with their Falcon rockets last week. In fact, we were treated to the seventh Falcon Heavy launch. As you can see in this pre-launch photo of the rocket, the side boosters are fitted out with landing legs, but that center core isn't. So SpaceX didn't plan on recovering all three boosters, just the side ones. For a while, we thought that they might have abandoned the idea of recovering the core stage completely, but for now at least, the launch of NASA's Viper Lunar Rover, scheduled for late 2024, is still expected to recover all three boosters, something never achieved yet. The center core has always either crashed into the sea, been deliberately expended, or in the case of the Arabsat 6A mission, successfully landed but then subsequently fell over and lost during transport back to port in heavy seas. Anyway, back to last week's mission, another interesting feature of this Falcon Heavy is the grey band seen on the second stage. This is used in missions that feature an extended coast phase between burns, as it enables greater heat absorption from sunlight, helping warm the RP-1 kerosene tank during the longer coasting period. When it gets too cold, kerosene becomes viscous and slushy, which can hinder ignition or even damage the upper stage's Merlin engine if ingested. This is the first time that we've seen this grey band used for Falcon Heavy and the third time it's been used in any Falcon rocket. So anyway, the launch. Falcon Heavy blasted off the pad into the night sky on Saturday the 29th of July, carrying the Echo Star 24 to geostationary orbit. Echo Star 24, also referred to as Jupiter 3, is an impressive ultra-high density satellite. 
It operates on the car band and boasts a substantial size, featuring multiple spots for enhanced performance. Furthermore, weighing in at just over 9 tons, Jupiter 3 is the heaviest geostationary satellite ever launched. As for the Falcon Heavy side boosters, they lit up the night sky as they successfully touched down on the landing pads back at Cape Canaveral. The other Falcon launch we saw last week was an old reliable Falcon 9, carrying the latest batch of Starlink V2 minis to low Earth orbit on mission Starlink Group 6-6. This took place on Friday, and the booster lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. Shortly following stage separation, the first stage booster successfully landed on the a shortfall of Gravitas drone ship, completing its 15th overall flight. Now, it wasn't just Falcons taking flight last week, China and India took to the skies as well. On Wednesday, China's Zichang Satellite Launch Center successfully launched the fifth Yaogan 36 mission. Utilizing the Long March 2D rocket, this mission placed the three Yaogan 36 remote sensing satellites into their designated orbits. On Sunday, the Indian Space Research Organization successfully launched the PSLV-C56 mission, cat footage here used to fend against copyright claims sadly. The vehicle took off from the first launch pad at the Satish Dhawan Space Center. The rocket used here was a polar satellite launch vehicle in its core alone configuration, which carried the DS-SAR satellite, a radar imaging Earth observation satellite weighing in at around 360 kilograms and equipped with a synthetic aperture radar payload. Alongside the primary payload, six rideshare small satellites were also launched. Looking ahead, Northrop Grumman's 19th commercial resupply mission to the International Space Station is set to launch towards the station in the coming days. The mission encompasses a multitude of scientific studies, including fire suppression, gene therapy, atmospheric monitoring and other experiments accompanied by space-flown student artwork. The Cygnus cargo spacecraft has been scheduled for liftoff from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia on Tuesday. Of the diverse science experiments occurring on the station this week, one centers on examining epigenetic adaptations in plants, with the aim of comprehending methods to cultivate successive generations of crops in space and devising strategies for acclimating economically vital plants to flourish in Earth's marginal and reclaimed habitats. Recently, NASA's Johnson Space Center conducted a news conference to highlight the impending SpaceX Crew-7 mission, which boasts a crew comprising of NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbili, European Space Agency astronaut Andrea Mogensen, Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Satoshi Furukawa, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov. NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara also participated in the crew briefing and interviews. She would join Crew 7 on the station approximately one month after their launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Now it's time for Artemis news. The Artemis launch team at Kennedy Space Center carried out its inaugural simulation for the upcoming Artemis 2 mission. Their focus lies in preparing for the moonbound journey and ensuring that all mission systems are thoroughly tested and ready for deployment. Meanwhile, the Artemis 2 crew paid a visit to Naval Base San Diego to participate in the crucial preparations for the underway recovery test 10. This test aims to guarantee safe retrieval of both the crew and the Orion spacecraft from the Pacific Ocean following their voyage around the moon on Artemis 2. Additionally, images and videos showcased the dedicated efforts of MOVE crews at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Here, you can see them transporting the launch vehicle stage adapter for Artemis 3's SLS to another facility for the next phase of manufacturing. Technicians at the new facility will begin preparations for the frangible joint assembly. The frangible joint assembly, positioned at the top of the adapter, plays a crucial role in separating the adapter and the rocket's core stage, located below, from the upper elements of the SLS rocket and the Orion spacecraft. It is worth mentioning that the launch vehicle stage adapter for Artemis 3 marks the final iteration of its kind, as future SLS rockets will transition to the more potent Block 1B configuration, commencing with Artemis 4. Speaking of new rocket designs, Rocket Lab has dropped its latest redesign of Neutron. Here's a summary of all the iterations we've seen so far. We started with a very Falcon 9 looking machine on the left, which then transitioned into something very sleek and different in the middle, to now this latest one on the right, which in my opinion looks like something a little bit in between. Falcon 9 just seems to be the best design we currently have for reusable first stage boosters. Lest we forget that the Terran R went from a beautiful midi starship to what is basically a Falcon 9. <laughs>
Lion Aerospace conducted a live commentary MUN mission last week. Due to time restraints because of business in real life, I decided to make a video with no edits, cuts, or footage speed ups so you can see what it takes to get to the MUN in the current state of KSB2, bugs and glitches and all. So if that sounds like it might be interesting to you, then it may well be one of the videos on screen. Also there are my generous Patreon and channel members, it's their financial support that makes all of this content possible. So huge thanks to Ode there. But anyway guys, thank you so much for tuning in this week, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll catch you in the next one.